Hi everyone, welcome to our first ever video tutorial presented by Macademy. Uh, today we're having a look at cellular respiration and we know that cellular respiration involves the breakdown of glucose within the cells uh, in an effort to produce ATP and ATP is the is the energy that we use inside of the cells in order to power all the various functions and uh, mechanisms that take place that occur. So first of all, glucose, as it enters into the cell, it's broken down in the cytoplasm through the process of glycolysis, right? And glycolysis takes glucose, which is a six carbon molecule, and it breaks it down using two ATP into two p-gal molecules. So here's our p-gal molecules. Each of these is a three carbon molecule. You, so you can see that glucose, the original six carbon molecule, has just been broken down into two three carbon molecules. And we said just a second ago that that actually uses ATP. It requires energy to make this breakdown occur. So the first step of glycolysis is actually going to use two ATP molecules. But from there, these two p-gal molecules are converted into two pyruvate molecules. And these pyruvate molecules are a lower energy molecule. And therefore, this process produces some energy. And these pyruvates are still three carbon molecules. Basically, it's just been a rearrangement from the three carbon p-gals into the three carbon pyruvates. And we said a moment ago, because the pyruvate is a lower energy molecule, this is actually going to produce ATP. So in this step, we're producing four ATP. And it also releases some, some extra electrons. There's some electrons that are uh, present in the p-gal molecules that aren't required to produce the pyruvate molecules. So those extra electrons are, are captured by a molecule called NADH. So these are two molecules that we're going to see as we go throughout uh, the process. ATP is an energy carrying molecule and NADH is an electron carrying molecule. And we'll see how these are uh, important as we move through the process. So, so far, we've now finished glycolysis, right? We can see that one glucose molecule, a six carbon molecule, has been broken down into two p-gal molecules, each of three carbons, but that's required some energy, two ATPs. But then each p-gal molecule has been converted into a pyruvate molecule, right? It's been rearranged and that actually releases some energy. So in the end, glycolysis produces a net 2 ATP and it produces a net 2 NADHs, which we're going to see how they're used as we continue throughout. The next, next stage of cellular respiration is called the transition reaction. And in the transition reaction, these pyruvate molecules transition inside of the mitochondria. So they started in the cytoplasm, but you can see now that we're moving inside the mitochondrial matrix, all right, which is passed through two membranes in order to get inside the mitochondria, right? There's the first one and there's the second one there. But in the process of pyruvate moving inside, it's actually going to lose one of its carbon. So a carbon dioxide is going to be released. So the CO2 that we breathe out, the carbon dioxide that we know is in the, the, um, the breath that, that leaves our body, this is one of the places that this carbon dioxide is being produced. Um, but as a result of losing this carbon dioxide, okay, we also produce some NADH. So just like we saw earlier in glycolysis, right, there are extra electrons that aren't used in the next molecule that's made. So as the pyruvate undergoes the transition reaction, it loses one carbon dioxide, some extra electrons are snapped up by NADH, and what's made is a molecule called acetyl. And this acetyl group is a two carbon molecule, which makes sense, right? Because we had two carbons here, plus the one that we lost, 
right, to carbon dioxide, and that would have been the three carbons that we had back here in pyruvate. Uh, so three carbon pyruvate undergoes the transition reaction, one carbon dioxide molecule is lost, which we then breathe out, one NADH captures some extra electrons from conversion, and the leftover acetyl group enters into the mitochondrial matrix. From here, a small enzyme called coenzyme A, it picks up the acetyl group and it helps carry it on to next reaction. So coenzyme A, it binds onto acetyl to make the cleverly named acetyl coenzyme A. And it's going to carry this acetyl group, this two carbon molecule, there's no change that's taken place, this two carbon molecule, into the next stage of cellular respiration, which is called the Krebs cycle. So just to recap, on the transition reaction, right, remember we've had one pyruvate that has lost a carbon dioxide and produced an NADH in order to make acetyl. But don't forget, right, this process has actually happened twice because there were two pyruvate molecules from that original glucose. So overall, the transition reaction converts two pyruvates into two acetyls, thereby losing two carbon dioxides and producing two NADH molecules, which again, just like we saw before in glycolysis, um, those will be carrying electrons uh, to a further stage in the process. So let's keep going. Our acetyl coenzyme A, it enters into the Krebs cycle and it finds a molecule called oxaloacetate. Oxaloacetate. And this is a four carbon molecule. So this four carbon molecule, as it combines with the acetyl group from acetyl coenzyme A, right? You can guess the four carbons plus the two carbons from acetyl. This is going to produce a six carbon molecule, and we call this six carbon molecule citrate. So the citrate molecule then is sort of the first main molecule of the Krebs cycle after it's combined the, um, the products of the transition reaction and the leftover oxaloacetate that helps keep the cycle going along. This six carbon citrate molecule then undergoes a breakdown and it becomes a five carbon molecule but in the process it has released one CO2 right that's why it's um, got one less carbon so there's a CO2 that's being released right but just like we saw in the transition reaction when you release a CO2 okay some extra electrons become available and we're able to produce yet another NADH, an electron carrying molecule. And then the process, very similarly, okay, our five carbon molecule breaks down into a four carbon molecule. And that process again obviously has released one CO2 and at the same time produced one NADH with those extra electrons that are left laying around starting to get a little bit crowded in here. Okay. And additionally, in this step, we produce one more ATP. So we haven't seen ATP in a little while, but here it is. We're making a little bit more of it now. And then this four carbon molecule is going to be rearranged to reproduce oxaloacetate. So you can see in this stage, there's no more carbon being released. There's no more carbon dioxide because it's just a four carbon molecule being rearranged into a four carbon molecule. But this rearrangement actually enables more electrons to free up, which lets us produce yet another NADH. It's also going to allow us to produce one FADH2. And FADH2 is another molecule very similar to NADH, which is going to carry electrons. And we'll see how it differs from NADH as we continue. So, recapping all the way from the beginning. Glucose enters the cell, and it enters into the cytoplasm. And in the cytoplasm, glucose, a six-carbon molecule, 
is broken down through the process of glycolysis. This requires 2 ATP in order to work. Okay? Now these products of uh, this first stage of glycolysis, PGAL, which are each three carbon molecules, undergo a conversion. The PGAL, each PGAL molecule converts into a pyruvate molecule. And you can see it's just another rearrangement. Three carbons, still three carbons. But this change is allowing us to produce four ATP molecules, as well as two NADH molecules. So at the end of glycolysis, we're plus two ATP, right? Minus two and plus four gives us plus two overall. And it also lets us produce two electron carrying molecules in the form of NADH. These three carbon pyruvate molecules, remember there's two of them, are going to enter into the transition reaction and each one will release a carbon dioxide as it becomes acetyl, a two carbon molecule. And this process produces an NADH electron carrying molecule. But remember, the two pyruvates means that we've produced two NADH molecules in the transition reaction. So that's two from the transition reaction plus two that we created back in glycolysis. So we've now made four NADH electron carrying molecules as well as plus two ATP energy carrying molecules. And as we exit the transition reaction, coenzyme A enters and binds onto acetyl to help acetyl make the transition into the Krebs cycle. So coenzyme A, as it releases the acetyl group, actually cycles back to start its process again. So coenzyme A is just going to pick up acetyl and drop it off. And then it's going to go back and it's going to pick up acetyl and it's going to go and drop it off with oxaloacetate. So it's just cycling around. So oxaloacetate now, with the help of coenzyme A, binds onto the acetyl group. So a four carbon molecule binding on with a two carbon molecule is going to produce our six carbon citrate. And this is where the Krebs cycle begins. Okay? The Krebs cycle is also called the citric acid cycle because another name for citrate is citric acid. All oh, those scientists cleverly naming everything. So citrate then undergoes a breakdown. One carbon is released, resulting in a five carbon molecule. And this process frees up some electrons which are captured by NADH. The five carbon molecule then undergoes a very similar breakdown resulting in a four carbon molecule. This process clearly has released one CO2. It's produced another NADH electron carrying molecule because of some free, free electrons. And it's also produced as a result of some freed energy, an ATP energy carrying molecule. That four carbon molecule then undergoes a rearrangement to return to the four carbon oxaloacetate molecule. And in doing so, some more electrons are freed up, creating yet another NADH molecule, as well as a new FADH2 molecule. So the Krebs cycle has produced three NADH molecules, one ATP molecule, and one FADH2 molecule. But remember that the Krebs cycle is happening twice because we had two acetyls, because we had two pyruvates. Right? So the Krebs cycle actually produces six NADH molecules and two ATPs and two FADH2s. These NADH molecules then carrying their, their electrons are going to transition to complex one. And once they arrive at complex one, the electrons from NADH are going to be released. And this breaks down NADH into NAD plus and H plus and allows it to return to the Krebs cycle or maybe back to the transition reaction or maybe back to glycolysis in order to pick up more electrons. But what do these electrons do? I mean, we've been making all of these NADHs, 10 of them all together, just to drop electrons off at this fourth stage, which is called the electron transport chain. And as you can imagine, the electron transport chain is going to transport electrons through a series of molecules. That's the chain. But what do they do? There's got to be a reason for them. These electrons 
are going to draw positively charged hydrogen ions towards them. But just before they arrive, the electrons are going to jump from one complex to the next. And as they jump from one complex to the next, it's too late for hydrogen to stop, and hydrogen flows out. You can see it being trapped here in the intermembrane space between the outer membrane and the inner membrane of the mitochondrion. And each time the electron jumps, more and more hydrogen flows through and is trapped inside the intermembrane space. Okay? Finally, the electron on the far end is going to be scooped up by the oxygen that we breathe. So that oxygen hangs out here on the end of the electron transport chain. And the oxygen is highly electronegative, and it's going to draw the hydrogens in. The electron jumps onto the oxygen, okay, and that hydrogen gets trapped inside. And the oxygen then, because it's negatively charged, picks up these hydrogens. And as you can see, these hydrogens now bind on to create a water molecule, right? There's H, 2, and O, right? And that water molecule is going to be um, released back sort of into the cell and is going to help some other chemical reactions. But what we've seen now is that all of these hydrogens, okay, they end up increasing the concentration of hydrogen here in the intermembrane space. So those start transitioning along okay, towards ATP synthase, which allows them to diffuse back inside of the mitochondria. Right? And as they diffuse back in, what they're enabling ATP synthase to do is to start functioning. So ATP synthase then is going to convert ADP plus P and it's going to take these two things and it's going to attach them together. Now the hydrogen, remember, is not used in this process. The hydrogen is just powering the ATP synthase and making it function, right? But as it works, ATP synthase is able to combine ADP and P to produce ATP. And this process itself is actually going to produce 32 more ATP molecules. And that is where the vast majority of ATP comes from. But let's not forget these FADH2 molecules. These FADH2 molecules that were created in the Krebs cycle, okay, these are going to carry their electrons, very similar to the job of NADH, and they're going to drop off their electrons at complex 2. And as they drop off at complex 2, these electrons okay, enter complex 2, and just like we saw before, okay, the FADH2 is going to go back so that it can pick up more electrons. And the electrons are going to jump from one complex to the next. And here, so in complex 3, hydrogen is able to attract towards it. right? But then uh, the electron moves along, and hydrogen moves out. And this electron is actually, again, going to jump onto another water molecule. right? And it's going to help suck more hydrogen through. And yet again, that hydrogen is going to flow back through ATP synthase to help produce the ATP. So altogether, in glycolysis, we used two ATP, but then we produced four more, which results in plus two ATP. Those pyruvate molecules are then going to move through the transition reaction. Right, bind in with acetyl coenzyme A. Coenzyme A is then going to help acetyl bind with oxaloacetate to produce citrate, which then breaks down to produce a 5 carbon molecule, which then breaks down again to produce a 4 carbon molecule, thereby releasing another ATP, and then rearranging to produce oxaloacetate so the Krebs cycle can continue. But remember, the Krebs cycle happens twice, so that's 2 ATP that we've created there. And then all of the NADHs and FADH2s that have been created throughout the process are going to drop their electrons off at the electron transport chain, right? NADH at complex one. The electrons bounce through and create a proton gradient in the intermembrane space. And FADH2 at complex two. And it's going to 
bounce its electrons along the chain, right, eventually creating water. And again, the proton gradient is strengthened, and the protons are going to flow back through ATP synthase, right? And as they flow back through ATP synthase, that makes ATP synthase begin to function. And as it functions, it can produce ATP by combining ADP and P. And that is how cellular respiration works.